Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here, and welcome to another Civilization Overview. Today we're going to be looking at the Indians. So brace yourself, this is going to be a long one. First off, it has to be said, this can be a bit of a confusing tech tree to wrap your head around, and that can turn a lot of people off right away. For example, they're the only non-Mesoamerican Civ missing access to knights, and they have several bonuses focused on the rarely seen camel line. There seems to me to be a push for the camel as a replacement for the knight in this civilization, even giving the Indian camel a final upgrade that no other civilization has, and I'll be looking at how the Indian camel compares to the knight line in several tests a bit later in the video. If you want to compare the Indians to the pre-Forgotten Empire civilizations, they seem to me like a bit of a mix of the Saracens for the camels, the Turks for the gunpowder and the gold bonus, and the Persians for their elephants and their town center bonus. So let's take a closer look at this very unique Forgotten Empire civilization. Right after you check out this brand new viewer made intro, the first one ever submitted to the channel. Check it out. How sick was that? Big thanks to Mr. Fu for putting that intro together. It's amazing. I love it. He's definitely a guy you'll want to check out and he does some entertaining commentaries of his own. I've had an open invitation for a few weeks now for you guys to submit your intros featuring your own gameplay or whatever you'd like that's Age of Empires related. Don't let that video's awesomeness discourage you from submitting your own though. So let's get back to the civilization overview. First let's go through the Indian Civ bonuses. Their team bonus is that camels get plus 5 attack against buildings. Now just to put that into perspective, with all the castle age level upgrades, knights do 12 damage to buildings, camels do 14 damage, tarkins do 18 damage, and rams do 127 damage. The team bonus basically brings camels up just above the level of a knight in terms of ability to destroy buildings. I wouldn't say though that that makes the camel an anti-building unit by any means, so let's just keep that in perspective here. The next bonus is probably their best, and it's cheaper villagers, which get progressively cheaper as the game goes on. Here are the villager costs by age. Since villagers are about the only unit that you're guaranteed to make in a game, this is definitely a strong bonus because you benefit from it so many times. I don't want to overstate its effect size though, and assuming a build on a closed map with a population limit of 200, you can see the scale of food that you save. I've assumed that you're making 120 villagers out of your 200 population in this case, and you're free to disagree with the exact numbers I have here, but the point is in this particular build you would have saved about 800 food over the course of the game. Obviously this payoff would increase on a map with a higher population cap, and making another 100 villagers in the Imperial Age would save you another 1000 food. The point is this bonus tends to accumulate in games where you like to boom and make a huge economy. You have to play the Indians that way if you want to make full use of their strengths. In fact, the bonus does quite little in helping you get a big economy during the early parts of the game. The food you save in Dark Age is roughly equivalent to the extra food that Britons get from their sheep, which makes it a nice early game boost, but not something that's going to have a big effect for the typical player. The time that I notice the bonus at work is in the late castle age, when you're trying to keep your villagers coming out from multiple town centers while also trying to save away what you need for the imperial age upgrade. Similar with the Byzantines, the Indians will theoretically help you hit that imperial age a little bit faster, since that's where the cheaper villager savings start to become very tangible. Next is that fishermen work 15% faster and carry 15 more before they have to drop off fish. This is sort of an out there bonus since it's pretty rare to see people actually using villagers to catch shore fish. The only time that you'll probably make use of this is on a nomad map or if a villager built a dock right beside shore fish and you wanted to get a bit of food before they walk back to your town. One thing to note about this bonus is that the villagers already gather faster from shore fish than any other food source, meaning that a 15% bonus is going to be insane if you can actually make use of it. Here's a situation where a Byzantine villager and an Indian villager are racing to collect from their shore fish with the mill a reasonable trek away. 
The Indian villager finished collecting the 200 food when the Byzantine one had over 50 left. Considering it's already the fastest food source that a villager can collect from, that's pretty insane. It's just too bad there aren't more shorefish around normally. Next up is that camels get plus one melee and pierce armor. That might sound pretty good, but bear in mind that knights start off with two melee and pierce armor, whereas camels normally have zero of each. To see the effect size in a game, that means camels will take four damage against crossbows in Castle Age as opposed to three damage against knights. We'll come back to the camel versus knight thing a little bit later in the video, and I'll talk about the unique units as well. But first, let's talk about the unique techs. The Sultan's technology gives them a 10% gold income boost. This is across the board. It applies to relics, mining, and trade. 10% doesn't sound like a lot, but increasing all gold income sounds really good. So let's see how good it is and compare it to the Aztec, Turk, and Spanish gold bonuses. I set up an experiment here to leave running with the Indians, Aztec, Spanish, and Turks, all post imperial, with one relic, one gold miner, and one trade cart each. The idea is that after a period of time, we can see who collects the most gold and how they do relative to each other at a quick glance. Here are the results after 20 in-game minutes. We have to remember there's a bias towards relics here too, since you'll probably only have a few relics but lots of trade cards, so a bonus to trade impacts the game a lot more. That being said, in this test, the Indians collected the most gold overall, so that's pretty sweet. Their gold miners lagged a bit behind the Turks, as expected, since Turks have a 15% bonus and the Indians have 10%. Their trade profit was behind the Spanish by quite a bit, as expected, as it's a 33% bonus compared to 10%, and their relic gold was behind the Aztecs, again, as expected, but when you combine all those bonuses, they end up being the best overall here. It's one of those jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none situations. In this case, that pays off. Interesting to note is that the Aztecs also have a bit of a jack-of-all-trades thing going on, since they get a bit of a villager collection bonus as well. So I think that's why they're coming in at a close second. I think this test not only speaks to the Aztec's eco strength, but also the strength of the Indian Sultan's tech, even if it's only 10%. The only catch to this is that all the other civilizations mentioned get their bonuses intrinsically, so they get it from the moment the game starts. My test was done under post-imperial conditions, so you have to remember that this is a technology the Indians have to pay for in research after building a castle. Until you research it, these other civilizations are potentially getting a leg up on you that makes that gold gap a lot closer than it looks in this test. The Turks especially are probably making use of their mining bonus before the Spanish have trade up and before the Aztecs have collected relics. The other unique technology for the Aztecs gives the hand cannoneer plus one range. To be honest, it's really hard to evaluate the impact of this technology as its effectiveness depends on unit composition and how you use the units. At the very least, that makes their hand cannoneers the best in the game, right? Well, not necessarily. They don't get the last archer armor upgrade. So now we have to weigh better range with lower armor. It's hard to resolve that trade-off, although I think the intention is for their hand cannoneers to be very strong despite the low armor. It may not count for a lot, but in a test with two computers against each other, a group of 20 Indian hand cannoneers beat 20 fully upgraded hand cannoneers of a different civilization. Now, computer micro can be pretty strange, so I wouldn't put too much stock in this, but it is what we see. In real situations where you can put shorter range units in front of longer range ones for maximum effectiveness, I can see this being a strong tech in some situations. I guess the main point is to remember that your hand cannoneers are lacking an upgrade, so if you're going with the hand cannoneers, you'll want to get that range upgrade to make up for that. It's fairly cheap as well for a late game tech at 500 food and 300 gold. So now let's look at the unique units of the Indians. That's right, unique units, plural. Let's start with their castle unique unit, the Elephant Archer. This unit appeared in the original Age of Empires and is making a comeback in the Forgotten Empires expansion. Now, in order to wrap your head around exactly when and how you should use this unit, I think it might be helpful to find what a comparable unit would be that we all have more familiarity with. It's basic human psychology to try to understand something new by comparing it to things that you already know about. And people often do this with new music they hear or movies, and there isn't an immediately obvious comparable unit with the Elephant Archer. So people seem to have a hard time categorizing it, and I think that turns people off of it. I've heard a few ideas being tossed around, and it seems to get compared to the War Elephant, the Cavalry Archer, and the War Wagon. And I thought I'd explore these comparisons a bit. 
First, let's see how it compares to the War Elephant. The most obvious similarity is that they're the only elephant units in the game, so it's natural that they'll be compared. Both of them have high HP and a high cost, although looking purely at stats, the War Elephant is clearly more tanky in terms of how much damage it can take and how much it dishes out per attack. The two units share a similar weakness to Halberdiers, and Halberdiers get a bonus 60 damage to both units on every attack, although the War Elephant does hold up much better against close range Halberdiers than the Elephant Archer does. To be fair, you could argue the Elephant Archer doesn't necessarily have to be in the front lines taking the hits, since it has enough range to hide behind other units and fire over top. The only problem with that is that if you're not making use of its extra health to give you damage absorption in the front lines, and you put your elephants as supporting fire in the back, you're paying 110 food and 80 gold for something that an arbalest could be doing instead at 25 wood and 45 gold. You could even argue that arbalests are more effective in that role since they get extra range on elite elephant archers. I realize there are other units besides halberdiers that people could be using, but it's really the automatic go-to against elephants, so it's something they run into a lot and you need a plan for. Keeping that in mind, the elephant archer is probably one of the worst units you could be using against a halberdier. In general, I have to say, if you're going with the elephant archer, it makes more sense to treat them like an elephant unit in the front, or you're overpaying for a generic short-range archer. Statistically, there are some things that resemble the war elephant for me, but they don't take the same kind of beating on the front lines, so they seem to have a little bit different role. Five elite war elephants easily beat 25 champions, whereas five elite elephant archers are crushed under similar circumstances. They're in that tough zone of being expensive elephant units you don't want to hide in the back, but not really tough enough to be cost effective in the front. Probably the greater of the war elephant's weaknesses is the monk though. An Aztec post-imperial monk can consistently convert a Persian post-imperial war elephant without taking a single hit. With the elephant archer, the monk takes up to 55 damage, which would kill the monks of most civilizations except the Aztecs, even with all the normal monk upgrades. In this respect, the elephant archer can counter one of the war elephant's greatest threats. Overall, I'd say the comparison with the war elephant makes quite a bit of sense, as they can both do similar things for your army and generally have similar weaknesses, but the war elephant is a significant upgrade in power for a comparable cost. The units just don't quite feel similar enough for me to make them a perfect comparison, and if you do compare them directly, it seems like the elephant archer is underpowered. So what about comparing them to the cavalry archer? Well, the stats don't line up quite as well as with the war elephant. They're both technically cavalry and have a similar range, but there's a huge cost discrepancy and HP difference. The main thing that's nice about cavalry archers is the mobility and raiding potential. Cavalry archers can sneak in, scatter villagers, and may even be able to survive quite a while before they get taken down. You can hit and run infantry units and just cause chaos around the base, picking off gold miners and lumberjacks. Using elephant archers in the same role, however, is much less effective, even with all that extra HP. It's clear to me that even though it resembles a cavalry archer in terms of range and its cavalry status, the elephant archer can't be used in the same way as a cavalry archer because it needs speed to do that job effectively. The fact that you can make cavalry archers at archery ranges also makes them hard to compare, since it's easier to make archery ranges than castles, so you can more quickly build up armies of non-unique units in general. So we're still on the hunt for a good comparable unit. Why don't we try the War Wagon? Now this is kind of an interesting one. We can see they have a similar cost, a similar range, and they're both technically cavalry units weak to halberdiers. They have the same armor, similar attack, both have high health points. If anything, the Elephant Archer looks like a double HP, slightly weaker attack War Wagon. Where the Cavalry Archer was easily countered by skirmishers, both of these units have high pierce armor. We might think of both of these units as skirmisher resistant archers, in a way. Remember I said earlier that elephant archers in the back function similar to very expensive arbalests? Well, their four pierce armor and high HP allow them to take many more archer and skirmisher shots than an arbalest. The only problem here is that where the war wagon takes four damage from skirmishers because of some skirmisher bonuses, the elephant archer actually takes eight. Don't be fooled by the double health of the elephant archers. Against skirmishers, elephants take fewer hits than war wagons, even though, if you look at their stats, their pierce armor is identical. Elite elephant archers take 44 hits from an elite skirmisher, and war wagons actually take 50 when everyone is in post-imperial age. The war wagon and elephant archer perform about equally well against two halberdiers. 
as in they both perform terribly. It's like a race to the bottom. Neither unit can take out even one halberdier when two attack together. Personally, I'm seeing a lot of parallels between the Elephant Archer and the War Wagon, and given their similar stats, I would say they perform functionally similar roles. They both seem like late game power punches that are resource intensive but give you archer support without a lot of unit turnover, as well as some resistance to normal archer counters like the Onager and Skirmishers. The Indians don't just have one unique unit though, they get two. The other is a unique addition to the Camel line called the Imperial Camel. Not only do they get this final upgrade to the Camel line, but remember they also get the Camel Civ bonus, so they already had above average camels anyway. It almost looks like it's been intentionally set up to be compared to the knight line, especially given the fact that Indians don't have access to knights at all. Let's start by looking at the stats directly. If we line them up with their implied counterparts, it's easy to see that they match for HP, but the knight line outpaces for attack and armor. Bear in mind the 17% greater cost of the knights though, overall, and especially the 25% greater gold cost. Another thing to keep in mind is that the camel line makes pretty short work of the knight line and the bonuses against horses is one of the things that you're paying for with the camels. This makes the camels able to play a different role than the knight in that they can become a decent counter to cavalry. It's notable that while you may not think the camel line stacks up well against the knight line in terms of attack and armor or bang for your buck, if you're going for camels, you're basically guaranteeing your opponent can't go heavily into knights or paladins. Some civilizations, like Franks and Huns, don't have great options besides cavalry, and will have a difficult time reaching their full potential against a camel-heavy player. If they do decide to go for cavalry while you're going for the Imperial Camel, they're going to have a very bad day. Before you get too stoked on camels though, there's a big drawback. Here we have a knight attacking a town center. With this number of villagers garrisoned, he takes 15 damage per volley. You probably can't take down a town center with a pack of knights in Castle Age, but if he happens to take a few shots while raiding, he's going to be okay. Now let's see how the camel does. Indian camels have one less pierce armor than standard Castle Age knights, so we'd expect them to take 16 damage from the town center, one more than the knight. Or maybe it's 19 if all the town center arrows do an extra damage to him, because who knows how those town center arrows are calculated for damage anyway. Testing it with identical upgrades against the same town center and the camel takes 33 damage, not 16 or 19. That's 18 more than the knight for every round of firing. This isn't even a fully garrisoned town center. If we fully garrison the town center, it does 40 damage to the knight on a clean shot and 88 damage to the camel. In two shots, the camel's dead. Now let's try a similar thing against a castle in post-imperial. The Paladin takes 50 damage from the castle, and the Imperial Camel takes 104. It's obvious that what the Imperial Camel gains in anti-cavalry, it loses in building fire resistance. These numbers get even worse once they research Heated Shot, of all things. It's pretty common knowledge that this is because camels are technically classified as boats in Age of Empires. People make fun of this and say it's weird, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Don't believe me? Ship. Ships are commonly made out of wood. Wood. It's brown, just like camels. Three Ship is an album released by Yes frontman John Anderson. It's also the number of ships that Christopher Columbus brought on his voyage to the New World. Three. What was the third single from the Black Eyed Peas 2005 album Monkey Business? My Humps. Hump. Camels are famous for their humps. Still don't believe me? Another name for a ship is a boat. Boat. Rhymes with goat. Goats are in the biological order Artiodactyla. So are camels. Anyway, now that we sorted that out, paladins are so resistant to buildings that 40 paladins can take down a town center and two castles all in the same area. 40 imperial camels are lucky to take down the town center and they barely make a scratch on the first castle. That's definitely something worth knowing, although in most situations you would probably be relying on siege and not cavalry to take down castles. As long as you're avoiding castles though, camels take 4 damage from crossbows where knights take 3, and camels take 19 from pikes where knights take 24. It depends on the specific unit matchup, but camels and knights fight comparatively well on the field after the Indian armor bonus is taken into account, and the general buff in the Forgotten Empires, as well as the fact that the camel's actually cheaper as well. Just keep that weakness to buildings in mind. In terms of research cost and times, it's comparable across the board, although the camel upgrades are ultimately cheaper and faster. 
In summary, they look like a counterpart to the knight with a slightly different role, similar in their utility on the field but with a bonus against other cavalry and a huge weakness when raiding towns. Personally, and this is just me speaking on my own playstyle, I do like the camel's anti-cavalry bonus and I'm all about trying to use units efficiently and exploiting enemies' unit choices, but I personally would prefer to use the paladin over the imperial camel because of the paladin's better raiding ability. I'd still take a cataphract though over either of them. Okay, but let's say you do want to use the camel, and Indians are sounding like you're kind of sieve. We might ask what kind of unit choices could make a good combo to cover some of the camel's innate weaknesses. As a cavalry unit, they're not really that bad against archers, and their pierce armor isn't incredible, but they can generally take them on pretty well when matched up. Archers with micro will of course do better than computers here, but Mayan Arbalest do 5 damage and take 10 when fighting Imperial Camels. Remember the Camels also have 4 times the amount of health. The Camels are more expensive for sure, but I see them being a unit that's good against archers, not weak against them. They also have the cavalry and siege covered pretty well on their own. Being cavalry, they're good against the siege naturally, and they do 29 damage to paladins while taking 14. Their biggest weakness is to infantry, specifically the halberdier. It can kind of go either way in a fight with equal numbers. If I let them pick their own targets and have little involvement, they lose to an equal number of halberdiers. If I'm proactive and get groups of them to target one halberdier at a time, I can end up with 16 out of 20 alive, albeit quite damaged. It's probably not a cost effective engagement in the long run, although this test certainly speaks to the importance of even a bit of pedestrian level micro in turning the outcome of a fight. You might think, why don't we try backing them up with the elephant archer, but remember halberdiers are also weakness of elephants. In fact, the elephants are good against archers and skirmishers, which the Imperial Camel already has covered. It works, but it's not great, since they have the same weaknesses. So what about hand cannoneers? Now this is a combo that I like, since they cover each other's weaknesses. This is a significantly cheaper alternative to the elephant archer, and it's also an army that's faster to field and replace because it doesn't depend on castles to train units. Throw in some siege and you've really got something cooking here. The only trouble is that it's a pretty gold intensive combo, so you could always try throwing skirmishers in there instead of the hand cannoneers, but remember, the Indians get that gold bonus too. They really have thought of everything here. Okay, so I've talked about their civ bonuses, unique techs, and both of their unique units, the Elephant Archer and the Imperial Camel. You might be feeling like, well, we're going to wrap it up here in a sec. But wait, I haven't given out my grades yet, and it wouldn't feel right to skip that. I've tried doing something different in this video, giving you more depth into the units and bonuses and less into the tech tree. So let's just hit the highlights and I'll give out some grades so we can all go home happy. First, let's look at the archers. Gotta say, they have a really open tech tree, which I do like. They're missing the final armor upgrade and they don't have any archer specific bonuses. So for me, they lag behind other archer civilizations by quite a bit. They have some good hand cannoneers overall, so that's something. The elephant archer also counts towards this as well and like I said, you could use it as a beefy skirmisher resistant archer. You could even say it functions a bit like a skirmisher itself with the high pierce armor. Overall, I'd give them a B plus on account of the solid archer support, but I probably wouldn't use it as the main bulk of the army like I would with, say, the Britons, for example. Now let's take a look at infantry. It's a similar open tech tree here, which again, I like. Yet again, we're missing the final armor upgrade, and this is a bit more important than missing the archer one, I think, because infantry are in the thick of things, and they're usually responsible for holding the line to protect the soft units behind them. If your infantry is going down fast, that's a problem. I do like they have all the way up to champion, so I'll give them a B. Now let's take a look at cavalry. You've heard me go on about how they compare to the knight, and although they're not an exact replacement, I see them as being not only a strength for the civilization, but a serious threat on the field to other players that they have to respond to. That counts for a lot. I also like that they have the full scout cavalry line and all the techs that go with it. I'm leaning towards an A-, but it's surprisingly hard to compare them to other civs directly like that. I know I gave an A- to the Persians for cavalry as well, so maybe I'll have to bump them up retroactively and give Persians an A, because they're probably a step above the Indians, even if the Indians would win in a 1 vs 1 cavalry showdown. 
I really like the intention of making the camel a major bulk of the army, you just have to remember that they're not the same as paladins when it comes to attacking towns. That takes a bit of emphasis down from the power of the cavalry and makes siege that much more important. Speaking of which, let's talk about siege. Their tech tree is honestly pretty lacking in late game options at a glance, especially for such a late game focused civilization. Siege engineers and bombard cannons are really nice to have, and overall I feel like you have the normal go-to units, but you don't really have a lot of flexibility to try anything unexpected. For me that makes them a solid B. Moving on now to the navy. No ship right hurts the late game, and no navy bonuses and no early game wood bonuses puts them as a mediocre water sieve for me. It's probably fair to point out that the late game gold bonus and good eco do help out the navy indirectly though. I'm going to give them a C+, because they're passable, but they don't really excel at any stage in the game except arguably in early imperial because of their booming ability, and that's a little bit too indirect for me to say that gives them a good navy. Next we'll look at their defenses. They have a surprising lack of keeps, and there's also no bombard tower or treadmill crane. They do get fortified walls, but I still see them as an average-ish B-. I have to give a bit of credit to the increased hand cannoneer range as a semi-defensive related bonus, and the fortified walls means they're not below average by any means, but I wouldn't feel super comfortable on the flank as Indians, if I can put it that way. Now let's take a look at their economy. The cheaper villagers are obviously a huge bonus. As I said, I find this helps most in going from castle to imperial age. The economy overall though really comes into form once you've hit the imperial age. They really seem to me like a civilization geared towards the late game, which I think is revealed in the fact that they pay full price for all their units. Sultans is a really great technology because it's guaranteed to be useful. It's not as potent as the Aztec relic bonus, Spanish trade, or Turk gold mining, but all of those ones I mentioned have specific game situations that would make their bonus useless. Maybe somebody beat you to the relics, or maybe you don't have someone nearby to trade with. Maybe you're playing islands as the Turks and you've used up all the gold on your island. With the Indians, as long as you're generating gold in any way besides selling at the market, you're going to be benefiting from that bonus. I do find it a bit interesting that the Indians don't get access to guilds. It just feels like something they would have to approximate the Saracen's market bonus. Maybe free guilds would have been unbalanced. Given the importance of booming on many types of maps, especially at lower levels of play, I have to give the Indians an A for economy, as they're really one of the best at that strategy in Forgotten Empires. So that'll do it for this Civ overview. Don't forget to submit those channel intros if you're feeling creative and inspired. Thanks for watching guys, and I will see you next time.